Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Just Work Podcast. I am Kim Scott, and I am the co-host of the podcast and the author of the book, Just Work. And I'm Wesley Faulkner, the other co-host for the podcast, a developer advocate professional, and also an avid podcaster. And today, we are joined by our guest, Gilberto. Gilberto, can you please introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Gilberto, uh, currently in developer relations uh, and been at Snowflake, MongoDB, Code Academy, and and, in a past life, I was a a public school teacher. Super excited to be here today. Oh, wow. I didn't know about the public school teacher. That is amazing. I have a, (laughs) I, I kind of wish that I taught English in public school. That is, that's my alter ego. It was, a, it was an interesting time. I'll say that much. And uh, <laughs> when I tell folks I taught seventh grade, I usually get the, oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you for your service <laughs> kind of response. Yes. But, thank yeah. you for, I have eighth graders. So thank you. I have two oh, eighth graders. Yeah. So okay, thank you it. for your service. <laughs> yes. yeah, everyone it's should get discounts if you, if you teach public school at all. You should just, Something. you know, yeah. first in line at every airplane, on yes. every, air, every flight, yeah. uh, yes. discounts. Uh, for everything you purchase online ever, especially for school <laughs> supplies for the rest of your life. Um, and uh, I'm glad that you're on this podcast. I'm glad that we're back together again today. And in case it wasn't apparent, we both are in the same industry and we used to work at the same company. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Super excited to be here. Um, let's dive into it. <laughs> all right. Well, as, as you all know, I'm a big believer in feedback. So I'm going to read a page from Just Work, and I would love to get your all's thoughts on what I got right and what I got wrong. And I will tell you that I'm editing. I'm still editing. I thought I was finished, but I'm not. I'm still editing the, um, the, the paperback. So your, your suggestions may become part of the paperback, the new edition. All right, so I'm going to read to you all from part, and as you know, I want radical candor, so (laughs) lay it on me. Uh, So I'm going to read from part one, section one, a framework for success. What is radical respect? Radical respect, by the way, is the new title for Just Work, maybe. I know Wesley hates it, so we can talk about that. (laughs) (laughs) Hate is a strong word. Okay. Wesley (laughs) prefers Just Work to radical respect. All right. Respect is simply about showing regard for the feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of others. This kind of respect is something we owe to every human. It is not something that needs to be earned. We don't have We don't have to respect a person's opinion on a particular topic. We can disagree vehemently. We don't have to respect a particular action a person took. We can still disapprove and hold them accountable. But we do have to respect that person as a human being if we are to retain our own humanity. All too often, our biases cause us to expect conformity without even realizing what we're doing. And then when you layer management systems on top of that, that expectation gets baked into who we hire, promote, fire, and unconscious bias gives way to discrimination. All too often, we seek to establish dominance or to bully others at work rather than seeking to collaborate with them. And again, when you layer management systems and power on top of those instincts, things go from bad to worse. Bullying gives way to harassment and physical violation and physical violations and violence. These are human, not political problems. Progressive organizations drift towards coercion and conformity as surely as do conservative ones. The solution is to consciously design norms and systems that keep us moving toward respect and collaboration. Fighting the gravitational pull towards conformity and coercion requires much more than good intentions. Radical respect happens in workplaces that honor everyone's individuality rather than demanding conformity and that optimize for collaboration, not coercion. What makes it radical is that it rarely occurs. All right. So lay it on me. What do you think? I I like it. Um, One thing that you pointed out, you said that it's not political, it's human. But I also wanted to point out that it's actually cultural as well. Yes. Yes. either American culture or business cultures in America that I feel that there is some type of adversarial situations that they sometimes put people in where 
there is one person who's going to be a winner instead of the kind of the pie grows as success grows where people Mm -hmm. can feel as if, if there's going to be layoffs, I just want to make sure that I'm ahead of that person and I'm not, uh, I'm not going to lose my job, but I rather sag met, send send back the person next to me. So they, they are the person that will take the brunt of any type of recourse if there is a reduction in force. Yeah. So these, these are human and cultural. Is it, is it, is it, as I was reading, these are human, not political problems. I was like, but, but is that really true? <laughs> Maybe they are kind of political. I don't know. What do you all think? Yeah, I, I think that that was a really interesting statement because I think it, to your point, I, I think it could extend beyond political problems um, mm-hmm. in the sense that any human problem can become a problem in any kind of other sphere and or industry, right? Yeah. Of course, like we, they are driven maybe maybe a lot through through politics and also to Wesley, what to, to what Wes just mentioned, um, through culture and kind of what the culture in that region could be. So, like we have a hyper competitive culture here where where we live, right? And so everything is typically something that's calculated down to the bottom line. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, um, th- that was an interesting point. I. Maybe this is my own bias uh, <laughs> uh, in in talking about this, but um, I wonder if this could be extended to uh, respect beyond humans. Um, I the way that I think about it is, you know, respect. I try respect is like a key word in my household. I I, I like to think that like I live uh, through a philosophy of respect. But when it, when you when you start off saying respect for humans, the thing that I thought about was respect for, for life, um, right? All forms of life, um, the environment. And we think about how connecting that back to what we just said, political problems, right? Cultural mm-hmm. problems and how that actually extends into problems beyond humans. Yeah. yeah. If, if you're trying to connect that as a circle, if you will. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. I was just uh, a couple of weekends ago, I was out at the Carrizo Plain, which is this, it's sort of, it's a national monument. It's this big untouched, well, I wouldn't say it's untouched, but it's a big plain full of wildflowers and there's no gas and no water there. So there's not that many people. And when I was there, I was really thinking a lot about that exact point, about, about, I was in, it wasn't just respect. I was in awe of what nature did. It was like, it was like the most beautiful painting you've ever, it was really, and people were really, the people who were there were so kind to one another because everybody was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. You know, it was, it was truly, it was awesome in the, in the, not in the, you know, that Mm -hmm. was an awesome cake sense of the word, but it was, it was truly awe-inspiring. And I was thinking that we'd, that I, we need to extend more respect to, to all living things, to, na- to our planet. Yes. And that brings me to the other point where you talk about respect of people and ideas and how even if you disagree, you don't need to be disrespectful. Um, it's one example I'm sure everyone has heard about this is saying when you get feedback, it's a gift. Yeah. Uh, like a gift from your aunt, like a bad sweater for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Just because you don't like the sweater, you don't have to throw it in their face. You can yeah. thank them yeah. and understand the effort and the intent behind it without having to lash out about how horrible it was or how itchy it was. There's a way to communicate without having to be downright rude and mean. And so I think if if everyone was able to adopt that thinking of the respect, we would be in a much, much kinder, gentler place. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think, Wesley, as you were talking about that, I had this, I had this, joke I I used to do with my team when I worked at Google, where instead of like at the holidays, instead of doing a secret Santa or something like that, after we came back from the holidays, I would would encourage people to save, because we all get these gifts. And sometimes feedback feels like this kind of gift. That gift from someone in your family that they gave you that says, gee, I wish you were a different person. (laughs) (laughs) And I do think, actually, that when you get that kind of feedback, it's important to, first of all, like maybe assume good intent. But then if you think about it and you decide there wasn't good intent, 
to go back and say something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There's it, like a, it, the, so Gary, good, please go. Uh, I was just going to mention that there was also something really interesting you mentioned um, when you were reading that page about norms, norms that help sustain this, right? Um, and and I want to connect that to an observation that I, I feel I made while you were describing your experience in these planes, right? You mentioned that there were folks who were in awe, but also everyone was so kind to each other, right? And it was almost like the um, unstated norm was, this is such a beautiful thing that I think we should all work together to keep it like this. And that means that to do this, we have to have respect for each other and to be kind to each other. So it's almost like having that norm of this beautiful piece of nature Mm -hmm. To your point, you know, completely influence exactly the type of respect that folks were giving each other in that in that experience. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Uh, I think that's really true. And as I was writing this about respect, I sort of went back to the dictionary, as I always try to do. You think you know what words mean, and then you really start thinking about it. And often, at least I don't know what they mean. And respect has two definitions. One is showing regard for feelings, wishes, and rights and traditions of others, maybe including not only other people, but other animals Mm -hmm. and the whole planet. And it also means, so that's like something that we owe to everyone, but there isn't, the second definition is respect for achievement. So that's, that's something people do have to earn. And the fact that, that the, word means these two very different things, I think is very confusing. Like I Mm -hmm. I almost wish there were two different words because Mm -hmm. they're two very different ideas, actually. I didn't even think about that. Now the little, the, the gif where the little kids has the hat that says respect (laughs) in the audience, that's comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's a totally (laughs) different, that's something that was earned, right? Not something that, that, and I think it is very, uh, it's, it's very confusing to people this that that we have one word for these two very different two very different ideas. So maybe I need to write more about that in, in this as well because that to me was a big aha. Yeah, I was I was thinking about um, there's other book that I a marketing book called Made to Stick. I don't know if you've heard mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. And one of the examples, me being in Texas, or actually both of us being in Texas, mm-hmm. um, about the don't mess with Texas campaign about who Mm. was littering. And it was people who were thought themselves as independent rebels or whatever. And the trash from their trucks would get onto the highway. And they're Mm. wondering how do we appeal to this group? That is if we come and come as an authority figure and say, this is what we would like to impose. They would most likely do the opposite. Yeah. And so that's when they came up with don't mix with Texas because they found the thing that was unifying their identity as being rebels, as being Texans. And you don't want to mess with us by including them into the group that folding them from individuals to a group in order to make sure that that campaign not only is something that they would resonate with them, but something that they would point out to others and saying, oh man, you're not, you're not acting like a Don't mess with Texas. Yeah. Wow. And so it, it's, it goes back to what I was saying before about how this also feels like culture, American culture, but also corporate culture. And mm-hmm. if the culture is not put in place, uh, the framework is not made for that the individuals who are seen as employees or team members or whatever word that you want to use to group people together. And if that culture is not identified with the company and the people in it, that makes it harder to adopt the type of uh, radical candor or compassion or radical respect uh, Mm -hmm. that is needed to make sure that people can operate at their, their optimal. Mm -hmm. I had no idea about that, the backstory behind that campaign. I I can say I've been exposed to it since I uh, grew up here and it's been around for a while and definitely see it resonate on, on that particular persona, like on folks, trucks, you see, like that sticker and they're driving around. They're like, Hey, you know, I'm Texan, but it's interesting because I mean, you talk about culture and culture is something that uh, more than one person, I think has to participate in. And also everyone has to act out, act through and kind of live through for it to kind of live as a culture. Um, And it's just interesting. I just, I had never, never had heard the backstory behind that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. 
I hadn't either. Thank you. It's a great book also, if you made the stick, if you haven't read it. <laughs> it is, although it's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a little manipulative. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yes. But also, if you don't want to be manipulated, it's good to know the techniques that know, people use. Yes, what people are doing to manipulate good point. you. Yeah. All right. So should we move on to story time? Like, I, I wonder if you all want to share some experiences you've had, either with radical respect or with its opposite. <laughs> yeah. Thinking. Okay. Um I can think, yeah, I, I can share an experience where um, I can think of radical disrespect <laughs> uh, yes. that I that I experienced. Um, it's interesting. I think there are a lot of factors uh, really contributing to what I, what I'm you know what I'll share. But you know, I can think of uh, a time in my career where um, almost every single one of my contributions towards the thing that I was working on at this place was questioned. Um, by my manager directly. Um, and I, you know, I, I just, I, I didn't understand where it was coming from, right? And that's always the question um, that I ask myself, why, what, what am I doing wrong? What, what is the thing that's missing? How can I build more trust? Is there trust that is missing maybe with, with the person that I'm working with? But I, I remember um, almost every single thing being under scrutiny to the point where it was almost like I was interviewing for my role every single day. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, after having already proven yourself through, you know, tough, a tough interview battery, if you will. Right. And, and then also having to live through this day to day, um, that was really challenging. And that was ultimately, you know, it was not the place for me to be. Um, and, and I'm glad, you know, my, my career kind of moved in a different direction, but that is a very kind of concrete and clear time that I can remember around where what I brought to the table was consistently questioned and I didn't see it as a, I saw it as disrespect for what I could actually bring given all the qualifications that I had for this role. Yeah. Disrespect and also sort of stupid on the part of your manager <laughs> because, because they weren't, they weren't taking advantage of what you, what you had to offer. I think, I think it's also, there's a term for this called hypervigilance and very often what, managers and managers of all different kinds, but most often managers who are, shall we say, overrepresented tend to be hyper vigilant of their employees who are underrepresented. So that they they question uh, and it's it takes a couple of different I mean there's a lot of different flavors of it, but often they either undervalue the work. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you did it and it was successful, it must be easy kind of thing. And we, we've talked about that uh, uh, before on the podcast. Or, you know, I'm going to micromanage you. Mm -hmm. uh, because so so like, what were some of the examples that that were happening? I mean, I could, I remember not feeling like I had anyone that I could turn to to talk about this for the exact yeah. same reason that, that you just mentioned, right? Um, Overrepresentation, maybe, right? And so the person that I'm going to turn to is going to be in a very similar kind of boat as, as that person that I'm being uh, sur surveilled by, if you will. Um, one example is where I remember literally, uh, you know, producing a piece of work or doing something that drove something, it drove attendance in this case to a particular thing we we're trying to do with the community um, in a really strong way, just kind of knocked it out of the ballpark. Um, and that was my my particular, you know, my perception of, of how well the thing that I'd done. And then I think somebody else did something very similar and it was almost the exact same work, but their contribution was valued more than mine, right? Even though it was the same kind of journey, the same kind of things that we had to do, um, the type of goals I would, I, I would venture to say, you know, I, I feel like in, in the particular thing that I was focusing on, I was, there was a little more success there. I just didn't understand why yeah. is it that the same amount of work from somebody else with the same kind of outcome, successful outcome is valued more for them and, and less so for myself. So that's an example that comes to mind. I'm sorry that happened. And it's so frustrating in these tech companies when that happens and they claim they're a meritocracy and you're like, <laughs> Yeah. But look at the All numbers. The time. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then they're like, yeah, this person did better. And you're like, but the numbers tell a different tale. 
You know, yeah. they, 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 it, it's, there's this pretense that this is a meritocracy and we're data driven. And, and that is sometimes feels like the big lie, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Oh, 100%. Yeah. A hundred percent. I just didn't, um, you know, and, and I mentioned, I just didn't feel like I had anyone to turn to. And so a, a lot of what I ended up doing to try to understand this, I'm a big thinker. I'm a big reflector. At the end of the day, I'm going to think about what I experienced that day and figure out, maybe, maybe think about what could, could have gone better. Um, but I would go to my partner and just lay out the situation. It got to the point where I was like, Hey, is it, is it me? Like, yeah. am I, what's, is there something wrong with me? You know, am I not? And so you start questioning your own yeah. <laughs> sanity almost, right? About it's what gaslighting. I have. It, it's exactly, it's exactly gaslighting. And so, you know, there were effects that you could feel directly in the work environment, but then there's also effects that I felt internally, effects that I felt mentally, right? And, and that was a whole nother challenge. Yeah. yeah. So what did you do? Um, I started... I like to call bluffs. Yeah. <laughs> and, That's for you, you know, if if we if we are saying we're a meritocracy and we care about the numbers and that's what we're going to measure performance by, let's do it. I love to compete, right? Yeah. And so um, I I try to well, there are different things here actually. Build more trust with that person. This was after years of working with them though, and still having to quote unquote prove myself every day. Yeah. Uh, so, so just trying to build a relationship, get to know that person more, but also from the actual execution side, um, you know, here, here's very clearly what the expectation is and what I think the outcome and, and what success looks like. Here's what the work drove us toward. Now let's have a fair conversation about what this work actually did. Yeah. And let's just all be, let, let's have a shared understanding about, um, what is, what is, what does success mean for this yeah. versus, the goalposts kept moving. Yeah. Right. Like if you did something yeah. really well, great. That was good, but not good enough this time. And next yeah. time the goalposts would move again. So I, it was really about trying to set those baseline level of expectations uh, with that person. Yeah. I think there's, there's a, I think that was a great way. And how did the person respond before I say what I was going to say? Not I, well. Not well. I, yeah. I, not well. Because, <laughs> you know, going back to like them questioning everything. Yeah. Now, the methodology that I propose to what I would say, you know, fairly evaluate the effect of my contributions. Well, that was question two. Yeah. And so if everything is up for questioning just for the sake of it, right, or, or, or this person's being hyper vigilant, that's that's Sisyphean in nature. That's that's a you know, constant. You can't win. Yeah. You can't win. And, and so that was my experience. Yeah. They didn't respond guess- well as a summary there. <laughs> Go ahead, Kim. I, I don't want to interrupt. No, no, no. Go I, ahead, Leslie. I, I was going to say that the the what you're describing is something that I've experienced a lot as well, where you do get a lot of questions, but the questions aren't made so that they can gain understanding, but they're there to sow doubt in terms of what you're producing and, and the results. And some of it is blatant racism, but also, especially on a manager or higher level, if someone feels like a lack of confidence or a lack of clarity or a lack of really being uh, up for the task of the role that the person that they're there to manage, they want to feel that they have some sort of oversight, some sort of power of -hmm. saying, Oh, you missed something. Cause that means that now I'm able to contribute to the thing that you are well qualified for. And I don't have the qualifications for, Mm -hmm. and that replacement of, of them trying to seek that, 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 they're in a position of authority, thus they need to act like a person in authority. And that movement usually comes at where they're just comes at it from an adversarial perspective. Like you have something I don't have and I'm jealous mm-hmm. and I want you to fail because I want to show you that I'm actually better in mm-hmm. some sort of way that you do not have that type of power of knowledge over me. I have the power of like your continued uh, employment. And so sometimes that, that fights that lack of confidence where they really need that to feed their ego. And that comes when you, when you're trying to think about it as a person who may be part of a marginalized community of like, did I do something wrong? Did I, did, am I doing what I need yeah. to be 
doing. Yeah. And that doubt can be so internalized, especially after it happens repeatedly at multiple places. And you're thinking, what's the common denominator? What is the thing yeah. that is consistent? And it's yourself. And yeah. that if you keep receiving that, then it's hard to like, at least mentally get past the blocker that it's the structure that is repeating and not necessarily you as an individual in that structure. And I think the thing that I really, that is giving me comfort in hearing, I mean, I, I feel sad about both of you experiencing this, but I think also building solidarity between people who've experienced this. My experience with this happened when I was working at a, at a tech company like you all, or a different one though, probably. And someone got promoted, not just one level above me, but two. And they sent out the rationale, for, and I'd been trying to get promoted for a while, and they sent the rationale for his, for his promotion out. And the rationale was the, you know, he, he runs a business that, that's this big. It was smaller than the business that I was managing. And it was growing this fast. It was growing slower than the business that I was running. And he had this many people. He had more people. Mm -hmm. So it was less profitable. And I was like, huh, this doesn't, like, why did he get promoted? And why did I not get promoted? Mm -hmm. And I went to, I went to, uh, my, to someone in HR and asked the question. And my manager was out at the time on medical leave. And the, which maybe also was part of the explanation. But the thing that the HR person said, oh, is, well, he's got a bigger span of control. In other words, he's hired more people than you. And I'm like, come on, mm -hmm. that cannot, like, this is a data-driven, and, and, they, and they just looked at me like I didn't understand something, like I couldn't do math. I, you know, it was very, it was, and I questioned the same thing. I was like, am I, am I, like, yeah. It can't be that these people are this yeah. irrational. So uh, are we still yeah, speaking be... English? You're speaking yeah. English, right? Yeah. I'm speaking English. Yeah. yeah. You you go through the list, right? Of all the things that it could put possibly be. And the thing at the very bottom is is a thing you you hope you don't get to, right? Which is like, gosh, is it is it me? Is it something that's what's out there? What's floating around that like, you know, is affecting this? But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and the thing and here's the here's I think part of the reason why gaslighting works. I wonder if you all had this experience as well. But for me, that the thing that I last wanted to see was not that the problem was me. Because if the problem was me, I could fix that problem. The thing that I last wanted to notice was that that there was sort of systemic sexism in, in mm -hmm. my. I mean, I he and I were both white, but he was a man. I was, a, uh, and there was a, there was a trend in who was getting promoted, and mm -hmm. who was not getting promoted. And it was very, uh, it was very clear. And so I think that this manifests different for me as a white woman than it does for either one of you two. But, but I think it's the same, the, the kernel of the problem is the same. And I think only when we get together in solidarity and mm -hmm. and recognize it and figure out what we can do to change it will it change yeah i agree like uh the the difference is sometimes it, it may be not be sexism in the, the terms of like we hate women which sometimes when that word is used people think of that but it also could be like we like the represented overly represented uh person and that's the person we're comfortable with and so yeah. it's, it's sometimes it's more like we'll give more consideration in that direction and not even consider the other direction rather than we're going to make sure that these people of part of this group are held down, which yeah. I think it's a mixture depending on where, yeah. where the type of environment. Yeah. Or it could be, you know, sort of almost like unconscious bias leading to unconscious discrimination, which is still discrimination and illegal. But it's like it's not that the person either likes or doesn't like women or people of another race or people with a different sexual orientation or of a different religion, but it's that they don't expect to work, you know, they, they, they have one level of expectations and it's not a higher level. And when person, when that person exceeds the expectations that they have for them, it creates some cognitive dissonance. And mm -hmm. so they just reject the, they reject it. 
Mm -hmm. that we want thing we want things to follow a predictable pattern that's kind of the nature of bias and so, i mean there have been times in meetings when i've spoken up and it's almost like the surprise on the people's face is like as though the the chair spoke you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely i i i remember a, a, a different experience where we had gone through manager uh, a different company we all went through manager training folks who were managers right and one of the types of biases that we learned about during that training, we, you know, I think the company had paid for this very expensive firm to kind of, kind of come in and train folks, was one that stuck with me, which is similar to me, uh, bias uh, in hiring. So, so the tendency to hire folks who um, are like you, look like you, have worked in yeah. similar industries, right? Um, and we would come away from these sessions like enlightened, like, wow, okay, I'm not going to do that. This is never going to happen, right? And you know, the next week, <laughs> like it we would happened. get a new hire and it's like, uh, okay, it's, it's just happening. Right. And, and to your point, right. Like the same types of folks were hiring the same types of folks. And, and then, so what you would see at the very top, if you look at it from an org chart perspective, was this very, it was less diverse yeah. in, in all forms. <laughs> right. And yeah. this con consolidation of like subcultures almost where, 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 you know, it kind of concentrated itself at, at a certain level and above, but yeah, that that was that was I, I couldn't believe it that 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 could happen uh, with such a short turnaround. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and people really, I think the the insidious thing about bias is that people really don't they really genuinely don't want to be biased, but they won't do the that because I think bias has kind of like a moral tinge to it. They're mm -hmm. less likely to accept the feedback when they get it that they've said or done something biased. And they're less likely to have a growth mindset about changing their bias because yeah. they sort of think, oh, I was biased. I'm, I am an evil person. And that's not the case. Of course, we all have our biases. And, and so the more that, you know, we can, we can use a growth mindset and say, oh, I'm delighted that you pointed out my bias because now I can get better as opposed to I'm pissed off that you pointed out my bias because it means I'm a bad person. Like the more we can adopt a growth mindset and not a fixed mindset, I think the easier it'll be to point it out, but that's much easier said than done. Yeah. Yeah. I think also, also people are culturally, like we're going back to culture are, are generally thinking about their self as a default. If you do something one way and someone does something different, that other person's wrong and you're right. And yeah. I think that also that mindset yes, is part of it too. That's a bias. And so. I also with managers is like looking at the way that I, I go about things. And if they don't understand the process, regardless of the outcome, if the process itself is different than the process they would have taken, they will disregard the outcome as well. So totally agree with you. Yeah. So a couple of things I want to, I want to offer a couple of suggestions for folks so that people are not left feeling helpless. If you're in a situation where you go to the unconscious bias, like Gilberto just explained, you go to the unconscious bias training, everybody's like, oh, that's horrible. And then the next thing you know, all the people who are getting promoted look sort of similar to one another. Uh, you're, you're, you're getting less diverse, which generally happens at organizations. You get less diverse as you go up the, the, the chain of command. Uh, or I hate that term, the uh, yeah. you know, it's whatever it is. I don't know how to talk <laughs> about hierarchy in a non-hierarchical way. But the there are a couple of things you can do. Textio offers bias flags in 360 performance reviews and in your promotion packets. So that can help if you institute that. So you want to sort of quantify your bias. Another thing that I've seen leaders do is hire bias busters in their in their meetings, in their hiring meetings and in their promotion meetings. And that can be very helpful. I think I told a story about I was I was hired by a CEO to point out bias in a promotion meeting. And there were two people up for promotion, a man and a woman, and they referred to the man as a great leader. And then they referred to the woman as a real mother hen. I'm like, all right, back up the train. Uh, you know, we've got to, we've got to uh, uh, think about who are you going to promote the real leader or the real mother hen? Like let's change our language. And 
you know, they didn't like to think that they were allowing their language to determine who they promoted. But, you know, so so we really, it was a hard conversation to have. Uh, but I think they, in the end, they, they agreed that it probably did have an impact. So those are a couple of quick ideas. What mm-hmm. do you think about those? Would that have helped in that organization? I... I had never heard of the idea of a bias buster. I love that. <laughs> yeah, yes, I think that is that is the kind of um, support that I think someone like myself, uh, you know, was looking for and didn't know exist. And that's kind of what I was mentioning earlier about who do I turn to? What do I do? Yeah. And I know there are supposed to be structures in place at companies to, you know, be able to go out and 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 seek that help. But a lot of those times, those structures simply reflect the biases that already exist in my experience. Yeah. So I think something like a bias buster would have been exactly the type of thing that I would have been looking for. Yeah. Good. Well, and I think you coming on this podcast is going to help other folks find the solidarity that they need. So I want to thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry nice. that that shitty stuff happened to you. <laughs> no. um, but thank That's you awesome. for making yourself vulnerable and sharing. I think Absolutely. I think these sort of shared stories really will help us uh, create better workplaces. Because I think there's a lot of mm-hmm. goodwill out there to create better workplaces. So we just need to we need to keep pushing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, sharing well, your stories shows that there really is a need. There's yeah. there's uh, that that people are suffering and are being hurt by the systems that are in place, and so. Uh, really love that you're sharing your examples by validating the premise of the story of what we're trying to do here in Just Work. And we also want to hear stories from others. So if you are listening to this podcast and you have a story to share, we would love to hear that from you specifically. Um, and you can email us at the website it is hello at justworktogether.com. And you could also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and let us know how we're doing. And if you have horrible feedback for us, we want to hear it too. So hello at justworktogether.com. You can let us know what you think of the podcast. Thank you for your time. And we will see you on the next episode. Thanks so much to both of you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. 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 See ya.